backwards. Right, thank you, Ray. Hello, everyone. This is the weekly TSC call. It's a public call. Everybody is welcome to join and participate. However, there are two pieces of information you need to be aware of and take into account. The first one is currently displayed if you're online. It's the antitrust policy notice. Everybody should be aware of what it says and comply. The other piece is the code of conduct, which essentially says you must behave like a decent human being, that is. So, we have a fairly short agenda today, um, but um, so let's get started. There was, uh, there were actually two, uh, officially two quarterly report uh, due, but one was already, you know, uh, submitted last week. So the last one came in and uh, is the Hyperledger grid. And um, I want to thank Andrea for posting this. She sent an email to the list as well to let everybody know. I didn't see any questions or comments coming on the wiki page. I don't know if there are any. This is your chance to ask if you have anything that you want to bring up. I guess. Can anybody say something? I'm Duncan Johnston, what an observer, not a TSC member. Sure. Um, if you just go back to the report, it mentions something called Splinter. So, Splinter is another open source project. Um, now, if you go up, to, uh, go up, there's an actual link to it further yeah. up. Um, just to make you aware, if you're not, that this is something that's out with, as we say in Scotland, the Hyperledger Foundation. It's a separate Apache uh, 2.0 open source project. And we're not clear at this point where, where it's going to land. So it's it's creating potentially a dependency on something that's not governed by anybody or anything other than Cargill. Yeah, but the license at least is Apache, so it's sure. compatible. It shouldn't create any problem yeah. from the point of view. Yeah, but we're all, but yeah, I we're appreciate all aware the, of the uh, point of having a Hyperledger Foundation in the first place. <laughs> right. Is not to have things that are not, you know, properly governed meaning safe from harm, out of harm's way, being within the Hyperledger Foundation or something like it. That's all. Okay. So I have to admit not to be very familiar with Splinter. I'm not sure exactly, you know, I, it did, uh, you know, get my attention when I was going through the report. I suspect others have too. Um, and you know, it's, so I don't know how much we want to get into the details of this now, but, uh, it sounded to me like this was a good exercise to make it, you know, based on something else than just so tooth, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think this is fine, right? A lot of people work to build their stuff to work on Corda as well as fabric or something like that. Yeah, but there's a difference to build it to work on quarter versus include components from outside Hyperledger, right? There, this is uh, James Berry, and uh, I'm not a TSE member, but there are multiple projects now depending on Splinter. Um, Sawtooth is one, Grid is one, and I believe Transact is one. Uh, with the goal that the group the Bitwise is doing this is that the networking pieces of all three of those end up in Splinter. So I don't know what that does from a security standpoint, depending on another project to pull in. So I, I don't read this as a dependency on Splinter. This looks like grid runs on top of Splinter in the way that uh, Hart made an allusion to people making software that runs on top of um, Corda or another platform. I think you're right in this particular example, Dan, but obviously there is some conversations happening elsewhere around Splinter being incorporated or Sawtooth 2.0, whatever that is, being a Splinter service, which is a whole different ballgame. So it's worth flagging now. You're the TSC, you can go figure 
what to do with that as as and when or if it emerges as a as a uh, possible issue. All right. Well, thanks, Duncan, for bringing that to our attention. I didn't realize there was a strong dependency. It was more along the lines of what Dan just described. But uh, if SoTooth does something different, maybe that's a concern. I don't know. We'll have to follow up. Yeah, it's not. Really def it's not definite at this point, but it's been it's been a subject of discussion on the Rocket Chat for a little while now. All right. Well, thank you again for bringing that up. And again, I mean, this kind of input we really appreciate. And, you know, whether you're a TSC member or not, it doesn't diminish your input when it's stuff like this. So please feel welcome to contribute. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. And and maybe we tie this into the long term <clears throat> discussions because I'm sure there'll be other cases down the road. Sorry, what did you say, Mark? Do we tie this into the long-term strategy discussions coming up because we'll have issues like this down the road, I'm sure. You know, what, what guidelines would we have for bringing in things from outside? Yeah, I don't know that we understand enough the ramification of that one in particular yet, but uh, I, I take it from you that, yeah, this is probably something we'll have to look into closer and could indeed uh, come up in the broader discussion on framing. All right, so with that being said, is there any other comments? See, it is useful to have these report, uh, reports and kind of go through them. We just learned something quite important. All right, if not, I think we can move on. So, Maybe before, and I'm going to insert, uh, there was, for those of you who didn't, you would join and overheard some discussion between Dave and Chris. Maybe we can resume that very quickly. Dave, can, they were talking about, um, uh, you were talking about the security reporting policy. And uh, I, if you could just an update as to where we are and what's going on, that would be welcome. Yeah. Yeah, um, so quickly, um, we have a security bug reporting policy that is called responsible disclosure. Um, the way we handle is responsible disclosure. That's an internet standard for the right way to do things. As a result, we have to have facilities for um, taking in security bug reports confidentially, keeping them confidential as we work with the teams to resolve them, and we also tend to include the person who reported the issue in the discussion, as well as any engineers that would be directly involved in fixing it. And then at the end, when we judge its severity, we decide whether we do a CVE, which is a formal uh, disclosure of the security bug, um, or if we just do notices in release notes, right? Chris brought up the idea that GitHub has matured greatly over the last year in how it handles GitHub um, issues, including a new feature about secure uh, security policies, which actually is really neat in the sense that it allows us to create private branches. It allows us to pull in individuals who aren't normally part of the security team, um, but are essential to fixing a security bug and it allows us to collaborate more easily on our response to any particular security issue. My initial response to Chris was, I'm worried that security bugs would come in through the public GitHub issues and that maintainers and myself would have to sit on those and, and watch them constantly to make sure there's no security bugs land there, right? And moving, and if they do, moving them over as security issues immediately. But then I thought that was silly. Uh, we can set, we already have security policies, you know, security.md on all our files. Thanks, Rai. Rai took lead on that. And we can adjust that to make it very clear that if you have a bug um, that you think is security related, uh, just report it through the security mailing list and we'll take it from there. We already accept that as, an accept, as a, a good enough solution for security bug reporting. So I'm just, announcing that I have no reservations about moving over to GitHub to handle this. 
And in many ways, we've had to make uh, hacks to Jira to support our the way we want to handle security bugs. Um, but GitHub does this natively, uh, the way we want it to work. So I'm, all my reservations are gone, and I'll just leave it up to the TSC to to discuss it. If you guys have any questions or would like to see us move to GitHub, I'm I'm all ears. I don't have any specific policy roadblocks anymore. All right, thank you, Dave. So I don't necessarily want us to dive into the discussion now, but I appreciate the update. I think it would be best if we could update the uh, the related issue we have in the decision log, which is listed down there in the, in the agenda and the backlog with an actual proposal. If you and Chris can come up with a proposal, we can then put it before the TSC for this for discussion if necessary and then decision okay i will do that thanks for the direction thank you All yeah right. i just posted okay. in the in the chat arno the link to the github um you know the the new uh capabilities that they have in github to manage a security advisory you know creating branches all the things that dave was talking about um <clears throat> is there and you know again what we're you know I'm, I'm happy to work with dave on sort of refining the issue and putting a formal proposal together but basically we're saying keep things the same in terms of the front end how you report a security bug but then how the projects deal with that such that they can actually issue a formal security advisory potentially as a cbe um uh, i think we have a better process if we follow what GitHub has, has given us. So that's the essence of what we're suggesting, or what I was suggesting with Dave. Yeah, and okay. my news is I'm a plus one on that. Yeah. So, And more broadly, uh, I would ask, Matt, does this mean that we transition from Jira to GitHub issues? Is this part of that? But that's for later discussion. Yeah, I'm, um, it, it's a, it, and it's a good one, right? Um, and we should probably have that as a separate discussion. Um, but this is more really about, so even if we create a private security issue in JIRA, we still don't have a way of creating a private branch, um, aside from doing it, you know, secretly in somebody's personal GitHub, um, so that we right. can actually collaborate on a fix do some testing and so forth with nobody seeing it right um, this new policy that they have enables you to do that um, and you don't have to pay the extra fee of having a, a you know normally if you have a private um, repo you have to pay github um, for, uh, but um, yeah. this still allows you to have a, a non uh, private repo um, and, and so you're getting a free organization and yet you have the ability to create a private branch to deal with security issues. So that I think is probably right. the most important thing. And then actually being able to issue a formal security advisory that can flow into the whole CVE thing, I think would be a positive benefit for all of the things we do. Agreed. Um, this is something that, uh, the Hyperledger org was opted into the beta for like when it started, we tried it out, um, I was impressed with the entire way that it worked. The only difficulty was this front end piece that we just discussed. So it's already enabled across all of Hyperledger. You, you just have to, the projects need to go in and say, do the thing. So it's already there. We just need to use it. Yep. And all I see is we probably just have a training piece, you know, an intro video on how to spot a security bug and how to properly report it. All right, guys. That's super cool. Thank you. Sounds like a good direction to follow. So let's uh, again, I mean, try to formalize the proposal so we can put it before the TSC and hopefully we can have a quick decision on this. So let's move on. Now we're resuming the, the agenda as it was uh, first put forward. Uh, we are back to the long-term agenda framing issue that uh, we started discussing in full last week. And um, Dan suggested that uh, we hear from James Barry and William Katzak who gave a presentation 
at the Global Forum two weeks ago, and uh, that touched on some of this general topic, and they thought it would be useful to go over this with the TSC as background information for us to chew on. So I don't know, I saw both of you, James and William, uh, you're on? We are. are. So, so, so what we, um, I've been talking about this uh, particular topic for a while and I want to make this non blockchain um, or single chain specific, but I've been talking about the need to really have a lot of interusable components. Um, and that's what we talked about and Dan thought it'd be good for us to show it. Um, so I guess, are you going to click through um, this? Uh, and I can do it or you can do it. Um, I'll I can give you a remote control if you wish, or I can uh, click. But, um, sure, you can go ahead and just, I'll, I'll just say click um, on <laughs> there. Um, or I can, uh, it, why don't I do remote control and I'll just run it on mine. Um, do you want to present or? Sure. Let's see, or. Might be easier that way. I sent you a remote oh. control request as well. Okay. There you go. And did it actually, uh, okay. So what we've been, uh, I've been talking about this for a long time and just for a little background on Tachyon, just so you know who we are, we're uh, a four person shop. Um, we have um, grants from the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy and the US uh, Air Force. We've been building blockchain applications um, built around security. We haven't really come out with exactly what we're doing. Uh, we've been using Sawtooth as a foundation for that. And um, we don't have commercial products in the market. Uh, we've been making some uh, several contributions into Sawtooth uh, more recently. We started off on several other blockchains, um, including Fabric, and ended up on Sawtooth uh, roughly a year ago. Um, and over the course of the year, we've been looking at it as a, a piece of uh, how we want to um, take it forward as pieces. And basically, we're just going to talk today very quickly about is it monolithic programs or um, do you have pieces that you can uh, adapt by putting them together to do the workload? And what would a Hyperledger stack um, look like today and tomorrow? We did this specifically for Hyperledger. Um, and how Tachyon is particularly using different projects to build our application as, as that. Um, and um, you know what's missing from our perspective uh, from Hyperledger. So um, and so a couple of things have come out is the meaning blockchain sometimes is meaningless because of the way that a lot of the uh, distributed ledgers are going. And is it really just a design pattern? A couple of things that have come out that I think um, are interesting in, in this perspective. And a lot of the blockchains that originally came out um, were very monolithic, um, needed to be blown up, um, and really, in our opinion, needed to be put into parts that fit into the workload that, that you're trying to achieve. Um, and when I look back on this is, um, you know, standard software is an interface logic, data interface, and, you know, a, a blockchain database. Or is it really, needing to be decomposed, microservices, very much um, microservices-like compo components. Um, it's our opinion that blockchains will be assembled from the best of breed parts. And I go way back, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. Um, and I look back on where Netscape, AOL, Prodigy, were all the, the, you had to be on one of those services, you had to use their email and they were very monolithic. And eventually the internet, um, came along with HTTP and pieces started breaking apart and you ended up with Apache. And just for disclosure, I was uh, at, at IBM at the time and um, I started a project called WebSphere. Um, it, was a, uh, it was my first project uh, that I ran there. And um, I also ran the open source pieces um, where I met Brian on um, writing Apache 2.0 license among other things with an uh, IBM lawyer. And as we were doing that, if you look at Apache from 1997 versus Apache now, it's, it's a ton of, of different pieces that you put together to build an application. And 
it's our feeling that um, you need to be able to configure by workload. You know, if you're on the way on the far right, you're running a public network, the cryptocurrency coins, you have high TPS, irrevocable transactions. You go to the left-hand corner of this private company, you have a stringent consensus, but very low TPS um, and a variety in between. So you can switch consensuses. Um, obviously, Fabric and um, Sawtooth both allow you to switch consensus depending on your needs, but they use different uh, constructs to do that and you can't use those mechanisms. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk through um, is setting it by workload. Um, so, and I kind of did a, what about a Hyperledger stack? Um, you know, you've got core blockchains, you've got, um, you've got um, pieces starting to break out with Transact with the smart contract interface. Um, you've got um, a pluggable consensus breaking out pluggable encryption kind of under URSA, um, the off-chain TE, compute, et cetera. But um, are they really something that you can take from, say, Fabric to Sawtooth, Iroa to Besu for, say, pluggable consensus? Um, even if I go out of Hyperledger and I go to Ethereum, uh, Ethereum for Business or Enterprise Ethereum, whatever it's called these days, is, um, um, has a pluggable consensus. Fabric has a pluggable consensus, Sawtooth has a pluggable consensus, but they all use different constructs and ways to get there. Um, we think that long-term you need to have something, and I'm just concentrating on consensus right now, um, of having some sort of construct that would allow you to use a um, independent uh, consensus mechanism and plug it into any chain. Uh, we see this as something that, um, needs to be built out uh, further. And these applications um, that are starting to emerge like Transact or so, um, I don't have grid on there, uh, there's grid, um, can be built with components as opposed to built with on top of a particular uh, chain from the beginning. And so we started looking at what components are needed, taking the Hyperledger view of it and saying what else can be built out, starting with block storage. Uh, is there a reason that everybody uses a different way to do block storage within a blockchain? Uh, network and, and connection management layer. I mentioned that um, seems to be on the roadmap for Sawtooth um, 2.0 um, vis-a-vis Splinter um, appears to be where that's being developed out today. Um, you know, is there an operational dashboard that works across um, applications? Um, if you think of uh, the way you do UI today, you don't have a um, different UI for each application you use. You have um, different constructs that allow you to um, overlay an, an AI on there. Uh, data exporting and importing um, are really something that uh, should be standardized. You, you're starting that with, say, Quilt with the interledger translation, but is it really you know, pulling it out data exporting. Um, so these are some ideas that we had that you could take to the next level, um, make it so that say Fabric Sawtooth, all the other um, core blockchains could all be using that as, calling that as a service and within the Hyperledger um, uh, family of services and people outside of Hyperledger would come there. Um, and, you know, I'm going to turn it over to Bill and uh, let him kind of talk through how we're using these available libraries and why we think it's important. Bill? Yeah, thanks, James. And thanks to everyone on the TSC for, for having us here. I met some of you at the, at the Global Forum. and appreciate everyone who came to our talk and spoke to us about this. So <clears throat> what we want to talk here a little bit is I want to start by saying and explaining a little bit of how we we use Sawtooth in the available projects that are already that are already around. Um, so Sawtooth forms the base of what we're calling our Tachyon core platform. We're specifically not talking very much about it yet because of because of some of our sponsorship. But at at the core of it, you know, we're using Sawtooth for for all of our our core apps. Um, as you'd expect, each core app has its own transaction processor and transaction family. So a nice feature of Sawtooth that, that we're able to leverage quite a bit is the transaction batches. Right? These allow the state to be manipulated across families atomically. So if even if, if one transaction family has to 
interact with another because of some interplay in business logic, we can guarantee that these things are atomic because of a sawtooth feature. It's really nice. Um, we find the signing in the permission facilities is very powerful. It lets us have uh, per entity access control and with cryptographic guarantees, and it, it, it just sort of works well as it is. Um, and the pluggable consensus is also very nice. You can, we, we found that being able to use different consensuses for different use cases is, is, a, is a really powerful idea. And in fact, we're, we're doing some work on a different type of consensus right now under, under a, a government grant that's gonna go into SOTU. Go ahead, next, James. So can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so, so not knocking uh, anything about SOTU. SOTU is excellent. And we're, we wanna talk about how we could possibly make it better. Um, okay, so the next part that we, that we use is transact. So transacts in Rust with C APIs. So part of our, our, our using this is we've been working on go ports, especially the data structures and the interface. Um, although it's not fully integrated in Satu, um, it's close enough that some of the, quite a bit of the submission and management code is, is, is possible to share. And we're using that across our apps whenever we can, especially with our new go ports. So the fact that transact is, is, um, is, has been factored out is letting us ensure this clean standardized code for transaction handling. Um, um, just as an aside and as a plug of something that we've been doing shamelessly, we are actually working on how to integrate our application client SDK into Transact. So we have a prototype SDK for building client libraries. So the, the idea is there's a lot of boilerplate code you have to write when you're writing a Sawtooth or a Transact client. All the transaction signing, the, the submission, all of that stuff is uh, management of the payload design. It ends up being very, um, very boilerplate. So we have an SDK that sort of gives you an API builder interface. So you can you use um, the SDK to build your client, and then your application can then interact with the blockchain just using native function calls without ever having dealt with signing and things like that and transaction submission, following up to make sure transactions commit. Um, and we actually have a working prototype of that for Sawtooth at that GitHub, and that's actually um, the core we're using, we're actually using that, we're eating our own dog food and that we're using that in all of our, our all of our clients for all of our um, different components. So, okay, go to, go to the next one. Um, we're using URSA. We really like that, that URSA is, is sort of not doing anything new or, you know, revolutionary. It's just giving a really nice, consistent, reliable interface for it. Um, and one of the reasons we chose URSA was that some of our clients, like the Department of Defense, have very specific and sort of sometimes obscure cryptography requirements. So we found that there's a real need for very carefully abstracting all crypto at, at sort of a very clearly delineated point so that we could separate them and swap them out if, if, um, if necessary. So what we're, we've been doing is we've actually been using URSA and the URSA interface as the as the line at which to do this abstraction rather than trying to do anything um, well at home. So go to the uh, go to the next slide. So that that's just a little bit of a, of a, of a discussion of what we have been using in the Sawtooth stack, and we really like it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But <clears throat> that's not to say that there we don't think that there's there's work to be done. And some of the, we're going to talk now about some of the things that James has alluded to them, but I'm going to say a little, a little bit more detail. Uh, some of the things that we think would be really great in the future to sort of realize this, this um, vision of a sort of a fully pluggable, reorganizable stack. The first thing is really pluggable consensus. So uh, Sawtooth and Fabric both have pluggable consensus. They're not compatible with each other. In some cases, there's the same algorithm implemented for both of them, but you can't actually use them with each other. So we believe that, I understand that this is, there are technical hurdles to be overcome and there needs to be some common interface agreed upon, but we believe that Hyperledger, Hyperledger needs to have a well-defined standard and interface for pluggable consensus to as much as possible. And that's uh, from, the reason um, we're talking about this is that I think everybody here has, at least has an idea that implementing a robust and correct version of a consensus algorithm is extremely hard. There's a lot of testing, there's a lot of quarter cases, there's a lot of validation to be done. 
Um, today, this has to be done again for every platform that that you want to that you want to port that to, and then you have to maintain different versions for every platform. When you find security issues, when you find functionality bugs, so imagine that we could use the same well-tested and debugged code across all of the platforms. Then we would only have to validate the the interface. Um, I think this this would be a huge leap forward if it could be realized. So the games go to the next slide. Um, the second, and I think this is actually starting to be done. Maybe maybe we actually did make the right call in in uh, in in trying to propose this. Is that um, it would be nice to have a common networking and connection management library or component. So what I mean by that is, um, for example, Sawtooth uses uh, zero MQ or ZMQ sockets. Excellent library, very nicely done, but it's still too low level. What we what we think should be there is some kind of component that provides the common communication schemes or patterns. So peering in discovery, um, a reliable and tested gossip protocol, well, reliable and gossip is, is two different words, I shouldn't mix them, but a tested and validated gossip protocol and um, a reliable set of connection management routines. So it, a lot of these systems need to really do the same thing. They, they pick, a, pick a, a communications pattern, they pick a sort of a technique for distributing data, and then they just implement that pattern. It would be great if we had a library that sort of implemented all of these common patterns, maybe make it extensible so that if you need to extend something or modify something, you can for your specific application. But the core of this would be tested, integrated, um, and pretty much ready to go for whichever component you want to build or whichever type of system you want to build. Okay, go ahead, James. Um, the next thing that, and um, this is something that we, we've just started working on internally. We're not sure if our internal version is going to be something that will be of interest to the community, but um, currently part of the assumption with blockchains is that there's a replica of every block on every node. This has been sort of the, the one, of, one of the key or central assumptions of a distributed ledger up until this point. But what we're finding as we're, as we're talking to clients, as we're talking to people who, who want to use blockchains is that not all use cases really need this. Um, so we believe that block storage should be an abstraction. That is, you can have validation and consensus on a larger scale. You can have things distributed over regions, distributed around the world. You can have a lot of actors in terms of validation and, and consensus handling, but decouple the block storage from that so that not every actor at the validation and consensus level needs to have a copy of every block. So if this was abstracted correctly and you know, so when I say correctly, I mean sort of, I want to say elegantly, if this was elegantly abstracted, this would allow for custom storage and replication strategy. So for example, if you have a, if you have a system that for business reasons, you maybe want 12 participants in consensus, but maybe you really only need three copies of every block. Maybe you could build something that has a, a custom storage and replication strategy. And this would, this would also open the door to a little bit sort of wilder things like, um, I don't know, using uh, S3 to hold your blocks, maybe something fancy like, like an erasure coding type system. Um, so uh, the, the point here is that it would be nice to actually have this as a separate layer as much as possible from the validation and the consensus. Um, and I think it would, it would both um, make things more understandable between different, between different implements, different blockchains, sort of different systems, and it would also allow this flexibility in terms of client or use case needs. Go ahead. Um, this last one, it seems that um, this, so we presented this, but it seems that the, the world has been moving and this has been getting done anyway, is uh, key storage. So key storage, there's lots of solutions to this, but there, there has been no Hyperledger standard. It seems that at the Global Forum, I became aware that one is in the works. Um, I forget which project it's, it's supposed to be going into. Um, this was really important to solve for the Department of Defense clients. And we had, to, we had to figure something out. So we used something off the shelf, but integrated it. Um, so we think this could be standalone or integrated with URSA. But again, I, I forget the name of the project that is proposing a, a key storage standard right now. So this may be already a moot point. 
um, data exporting. So uh, there's a few apps, in particular the um, the software supply chain example and a few other ones uh, that find it useful to keep an image or a sort of a synchronization of the current blockchain state in a DBMS or something else. Um, and then this sort of facilitates complex queries and feeding that data into other systems. Sawtooth provides this, um, the state delta API, which is very powerful. It works well over either zero MQ or rest, but um, something like this, we think ought to be standardized. And obviously there's different data models with different chains and systems, but this, this sort of, the API itself, sort of the enclosing infrastructure should be standardized so that um, the apps which need to receive state from a blockchain shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel and, and implement a different tie every time you, you want to connect to a different type of system. Okay. So James, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, why not uh, you, the crypto community approach um, when you have layer two, layer three, side chains, state channels, et cetera. And the problem that's emerged is these are different companies and you have different people controlling the data from point to point. And I see this very similar to what happened on web services. Um, when uh, you were trying to get different companies to own the different web services and connect um, in and, and have a standard that allowed you to research, find and connect it in. But there's different um, and David would probably um, be on top of this is there's different standards for security, different ways that people handle data. And as it's transferred from uh, company to company, um, there are issues when you talk about large um, entity like the Department of Defense or um, an energy company like Con Ed trying to um, use a lot of this. They want it to all be a single company. So if you really look at it, um, what people are doing is going into Apache and then building out projects from there. Um, and I put this slide in a little different than I had at the um, Global Forum is I see um, open source really dying within the blockchain community. On the upper left with all those red circles, those are projects that no longer contribute to open source out of the top 100 out of the, um, um, the monetary top 100 blockchains. Um, other than Ethereum and Hyperledger, I don't see any other chain really doing anything other than a monolithic approach, use my stuff and you and only my stuff. And even out of those that um, are up, that are having a lot of contributions, um, I dare people to build about half of them. Um, I've been on multiple um, panels about this and less and less that people are doing open source or they're only open sourcing a piece. I see Hyperledger as being the, really the only, um, well, that and uh, Ethereum is the only two places that you can really develop. And there's a lot of traction going on, which is why I put the uh, Hyperledger stuff on the right. Um, and it's really the only open source community that is not dependent on a single chain. Um, you know, Ethereum's active, but tied to that single chain. And so when I look at um, these additional components, today Hyperledger has the house with uh, a few components but I see it becoming Apache with um, close to 100 components on the other side and able to build an application and not worry about uh, competition of, of different projects doing the same thing, but eventually coalescing around it. The other thing that's missing right now that I see in the blockchain community is standards with reference implementations. Um, a lot of times early on, if you look at both um, say HTTP and Java, the standard implementation was the open source project that was out there. Um, so what happened in EJBs, what happened in um, the HTTP project, if it wasn't in Apache originally, basically you didn't, um, weren't able to get that into the HTTP 1.1 or whichever standard was, was floating around at the time. And it properly positioned, I think some of these components could end up being the standards that whichever standard body um, emerges, whether it's IETF or uh, IEEE or, or whoever around this can use that as their reference implementation. And it'd be say block storage, which is a common component that everybody needs. So that's the way we envision it long-term. And this is just kind of our mantra, just from where we saw it going 
in 2020. Um, like I said, standardization should be using Hyperledger <clears throat> open source as reference implementations. More specialization in, in uh, the components. Um, as we talked about, general purpose blockchains kind of fade away because their parts become interoperable. Private chains abound, but the blockchain um, computational uh, capabilities kind of fade into the overall fabric of the uh, enterprise workflow. Um, public chains become validation, not full storage or computation. And storage of data goes off chain because you've got to lower that cost for enterprises. I think if you've been dealing in the enterprise and you try to have multiple copies by node, that becomes so expensive that it slowed the adoption. Um, anyway, it, it, our thought was take these components, create new apps to change how the work is done by workload. And that's really where the long-term impact is gonna be made. And just if I close out, just I, if I look at, um, cause I've been, a, I've been at IBM multiple times. IBM itself, if you go to the consulting group, they look at what blockchain do we wanna use depending on the workload and what they're trying to accomplish. So the consulting group within IBM has actually built out um, at least seven different chains from the people I know there. Um, and they haven't fat, you know, focused on a single chain, they've focused on multiple chains, um, and they're on multiple boards of, of these um, blockchain companies. And that's as a result of needing to have something different for a different workload. Wouldn't it be better if it was assembled by components, components that it then come together to build out the final application. So we wanted to thank you for your time on this. Hopefully this was uh, something that can provoke a little conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, James and Bill. I mean, this is very interesting. Uh, let me, uh, let's go through a couple of rounds. First, I would like to ask if there's anybody who has any like clarification, question kind of things for James and, and Bill, we could do that first. And then we can do another round where, you know, if people have reactions, we can start a discussion. So first, any questions? Sure, I had a question on the block storage. Um, would you envision that each participant, if you if you had the abstraction layer, each participant hosting block storage could use a different type of block storage underneath, correct? Um, well, each, yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure, uh, that would be a policy decision, right? Theoretically, each participant could use a different type of block storage, and as long as you have hashes and things like that of the blocks, it shouldn't matter. Um, I, I wasn't thinking about it in terms of this perspective. I was thinking that, you know, across your system, you'd probably use the same, the same thing. But what you're saying is absolutely also possible. Like, for example, if you were, if you had part of your chain on AWS and part of it, you know, in a, in a physical data center, you know, maybe in some crazy implementation, you might put blocks in, in S3. I mean, that started out as a joke, but I'm, I'm, we were talking about it at the, uh, at the Global Forum, but it seems like <laughs> some people thought that was actually a pretty good idea. Um, but you, you, yeah, I could see you using a different thing, but the original thought was, you know, maybe make it more like, um, you could envision sort of like a distributed hash table type of implementation on, on top of your blockchain. Whereas the node that ends up choosing, or the, the node that ends up being authoritative for storage of a certain, certain block, or that set of nodes might be chosen by a, by a hash table, a la Cassandra, if anybody's familiar with that. That was sort of the original inspiration for this idea, but I think making it flexible would be, would be a very interesting thing to do. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then I'm inviting TSC members to react. Any comments or reactions to either a specific point that was presented or the general gist of it? Well, I, I think, you know, he touches on the point that we sort of really need to decide is do we go to more component based you know what's our long-term strategy I, I think it's a good view of what life would be like if we went to you know more componentized that's the right word um 
you know, going forward, do we do we do that? Um, you know, do we make sure when we break components out, they're easy for everyone to integrate? So I think we'd need to go through and probably, you know, define some standard uh, interfaces, things like that for different levels. So that, you know, there'd right. be a lot of work there, but it could conceivably be well worth it for the long term. That's what we're right, envisioning. We're well. envisioning sort of a process like that, where where the interfaces are standardized, and of course you have to make sure that things are going to work across programming languages and things like that. These are different. There are different languages. There are different sort of platforms in place across the the, the, the ecosystem here. But yes, it, it would be difficult, but maybe well worth it in the long run. Yeah, I mean, one point I do have to say is that, you know, you presented the Apache Software Foundation as this ideal place of components you can just put together. The reality is it can be quite challenging to do that just because the sheer numbers, uh, number of projects may, makes it hard to know what's there, what is it for, and what are the pieces that actually you can use together in, in the right way. But... I, you know, so that's, we, we have heard, I've heard, you know, people complaining about the fact that in Hyperledger, we already have too many pieces and it's hard for people to come in and figure out what to use for. And so it's, you know, there, there's a downside to this. I just want to point out, it's not purely ideal either, or it's not just, you know, better in all, in all aspects. Some people would love to come to Hyperledger and find a one, path forward do they just say use this do this and do that and you know but uh, this is not to take anything from the proposal which i do think has some value and is definitely thought provoking the other part that i wanted to comment on was the standard aspect so i mean standard is a loaded word right um we can have some kind of common apis between and i'm literally avoiding the word standard you know, within Hyperledger, different projects like you were mentioning for consensus, for instance, we could say, okay, is there an, an API that we can all use um, that would be shared by all the projects that would make it easier for people to use different components in different ways. Talking about standards itself is, you know, we have actually said until now, the Hyperledger was not going to get into standards. And so, that would be a big change if we wanted to call it that. And the, the uh, you know, so I, just I, that. I would not uh, recommend getting into standards whatsoever, but um, a lot of the standards bodies sometimes will look for a reference implementation. And if you've got something that's pretty close on there or um, is working, that usually takes precedence over something that is theoretical. Uh, at least in my experience over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, and that's generally on broader standards, but I'm looking for more um, of, of a reference implementation, something that, that takes into account the emerging standards and implements them uh, properly as opposed to proprietarily. So Arno, I wanted to, to riff on your comment about uh, the Apache and Hyperledger being difficult to understand which projects should be used and, and those sorts of things. Um, when I was out talking with people, um, there was also this other uh, perception that Hyperledger is a base platform that all of the other projects built on top of, um, which obviously, you know, really I think ties into kind of some of the conversation here, right, is having that those common components uh, for which every single other ledger is built uh, using, if you will. So, um, you know, there's there's the two sides of the confusion that exists within in the hyperledger space, which is one being um, I don't know which project to use, and the other being they're all built off of some common uh, components. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Tracy. And, um, can I say something? This is Angelo. So first of all, I want to say that I really appreciated the, the, the presentation because feedback from uh, industries who want to, to use these components is very well appreciated and, uh, 
And I also am um, um, I'm a believer that we have to go in this direction of having uh, this legal approach that you can, uh, even though I'm a security guy and I, 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 must, I must say that uh, when you design distributed algorithm, uh, uh, you have all these wheels running in multiple places and they have to interact um, closely. Um, that, that is very difficult. It's, it's very difficult to get this, uh, this legal approach. But something that I, I, um, I got during this presentation was when you, you stressed about the plugability of the consensus algorithm, uh, I was thinking it makes sense to have a um, to have definition of ordering as a service. So you don't you want to externalize, you might want to externalize completely the ordering service uh, and then maybe even potentially buy it from, uh, from, a, from a third party. And there the API, might, if you go to this uh, to in, in, in such a situation, the API might be very, very simple because you need just an API to broadcast messages and an API to fetch uh, blocks or transaction, whatever it is from, uh, uh, from the ordering, uh, uh, the ordering service. I think we could, we might go even for other things in this direction, where where very simple API are needed. You don't have to think about too much about the underlying uh, technology that you are using. Uh, thanks much. Very interesting presentation. All right. Thank you, Angelo. Anyone else? Dano has his hand up. Go ahead, Dan. So one thing to keep in mind is not all blockchains have the exact same execution model. Um, one example being the ordering service. In Ethereum, it is uh, inexplicably tied. It's to the execution. You're not ordered, so they're executed in a block. So I think some of these services are great, but they need to have some flexibility when different blockchains have different assumptions about the order of operations. All right, thank you. Oh, may I add, sorry, I'm not, may I add on this? Because that's this very interesting, this, uh, this, point, uh, this point, because I, that, that's thing of tightening, uh, uh, I think there was also in the slide, in the, this point for the public chain that are mostly used for verification. Um, so it, it's very expensive to have the, the main chain computing something. So, and for enterprise application, this is even worse because if you, if you ask the entire network to compute something, so you replicate the computation on each node, this is just a waste of uh, resources that you don't want in enterprise application. So maybe it seems to me that the, 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 the approach that you have for execution and ordering execution together for enterprise application, it's not really flying. But that might be just my, my personal uh, taste. All right, then, you know, it, the other thing I wanted to touch on is, you know, practically speaking, if you said, okay, what would it take to, you know, adopt an approach like this? Obviously, you know, coming up with those common slash standards APIs requires, you know, people from the different projects to buy into it, right? And get together, sit down on a case-by-case -case basis for each API, you would have to have some kind of task force where people get together and say, okay, how do we do like a consensus API? What would it take? And have the project committed to say, yeah, we're going to work on this together and we will then implement it, right? So I'm touch what I'm touching on is, you know, so I, I feel like, we can all discuss this, but then there'll still be the challenge of, at the end of the day, the TSC cannot force projects to do this. We could, if we agree, this is a good direction. Uh, we could try to identify different areas where integrations or those common APIs could come in and, you know, advertise them to the project. Say, hey, what do you guys think? But we don't have the power of forcing the project to do it. That's no, just the way no, it is. We want to uh, try to force anything. I, I know that when we've looked at coming up with common consensus in the past, we find that the, the tendrils of the APIs end up going deeper into the stacks than, than some people might assume. So it, it can be pretty difficult to actually have a, sort of a firewall at that, at that API such that you could just directly consume a PBFT or a poet or, or something else in, in one app, one blockchain versus another. 
But, you know, it might be interesting in thinking about, you know, what is it that we can do if we can show a place on the greenhouse where there's an empty box for some sort of common consensus approach that might generate some more interest from the community. If we had maybe some sort of uh, lab contest to say, uh, here's a fork of fabric, here's a fork of, of besu, and we've modified how consensus is consumed within them, and here's sort of a proof of concept about how you might go about doing that. Something like that could be interesting too. All right, thank you. And thanks, Dan, for bringing James and Biel. I think this was definitely worth uh, our time. Uh, we're almost out of time. Unless anybody has any other comments they want to make uh, right now. Anyone? I'll just say Otherwise, you're welcome because uh, uh, I think one of my main skills is finding people smarter than me to do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. But so, you know, I have a hot stop, so I'm uh, interested in closing soon. And uh, I think, you know, this is worth uh, thinking about. So, I'm happy to leave it at this for now, and then we can follow up next week uh, and see you know, if there's any further reactions or thoughts that people have. How uh, we could, you know, practically speaking, what could we do next that would be a concrete step we can take as the TSC? All right. So with that said, and then I'm gonna close the call.